In the last video, we discussed the writing on the wall. A hand appears at Belshazzar's party and writes a mina, a shekel, and peritzin. And we discussed how that works, how Daniel interprets those first as nouns, then as participles, then he strings them together to make a message. We also discussed the potential that it could be a polemic against the astrologers of Babylon. But before we complete our lesson on the writing on the wall, we need to do this last section and deal with the historical issues that surround this section. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede, now that this is the controversial figure here, Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Now the problem here is that Daniel says after the death of Belshazzar, the kingdom went to a figure called Darius the Mede. Well, it's well known that after the death of Belshazzar, uh, the kingdom of Babylon went to Cyrus the Great of the kingdom of Persia. Uh, Daniel seems to suggest that the Medes took over Babylon and uh, that their king's name was Darius. Well, if it's actually the Persians who took over Babylon and their king was named Cyrus, then how can we uh, explain what is taking, here in, uh, taking place here in the book of Daniel? In fact, there are some figures named Darius in the Persian period, but the first one doesn't show up until 17 years after the fall of Babylon, so that doesn't help us at all. Well, there are a number of ways for resolving this, and I think that it can possibly uh, be resolved. There is good evidence to suggest that Daniel did not make a mistake here. However, many will suggest that Daniel is making a mistake here, either that he has bad knowledge of history or that he is intentionally trying to cover up the fact that the prophets didn't get it right. Now, uh, we want to go back and look at some prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, we discussed this in chapter 2 if you saw that video. But the issue is that the prophets said Babylon would fall to the Medes. Well, if Babylon did not actually fall to the Medes, uh, then that would mean that Isaiah and Jeremiah are wrong, that they are, that they are false prophets, some would say. And Daniel is reading Isaiah and Jeremiah, and he's just assuming they got it right when they actually didn't, or perhaps he knows they got it wrong, and he's trying to create a type of fiction that says they got it right. Now, that's what some people say. I'm not saying that, but I want to show you these prophecies. Isaiah is prophesying against Babylon. He says, Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men, they will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. A stern vision is told to me. The traitor betrays and the destroyer destroys. Go up, O Elam, lay siege, O Media. All the signs she has caused, I bring to an end. Jeremiah says, sharpen the arrows, take up the shields. The Lord has stirred up the spirit of the king of the Medes, because his purpose concerning Babylon is to destroy it. For that is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. Prepare the nations for war against her, the kings of the Medes, with their governors and deputies, and every land under their dominion. The land trembles and rise in pain, for the Lord's purposes against Babylon stand, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitant. And so you can see from those passages that Isaiah and Jeremiah say that Babylon will fall to the Medes. Well, when in historical fact it fell to the Persians, uh, this would mean, according to some, that Isaiah and Jeremiah got it wrong. Well, Daniel either doesn't know that they got it wrong, right? he's just trusting that they got it right, and so he's suggesting that some Median king took over, uh, or he knows they got it wrong, and somehow he is justified creating this fiction uh, where media comes after Babylon, right? Because the actual sequence of empires is Babylon and then Persia and then Greece. But in order to save Isaiah and to save Jeremiah from the accusation of being false prophets, 
uh, or because, again, he may think they got it right. He's sticking Darius the Mede in here. He's assuming that Babylon fell to the media, and then at some point, media fell to Persia. And this is a historical fiction he has to create in order to vindicate Isaiah and Jeremiah. And so that's how some scholars are going to explain this. They're going to say that uh, Isaiah got it wrong, Jeremiah got it wrong, and now Daniel is getting it wrong. Right? He's covering up the tracks of Isaiah and Jeremiah's failed prophecies, whether he is doing this consciously or unconsciously. They will say that is what he is doing. Now, I do not agree with this. Right? I think that there is another option. I think that Daniel gets it right, and I think that Isaiah gets it right, and Jeremiah get it right. And Daniel knows that Babylon fell to Persia. And this is not a problem so long as this figure, Darius the Mede, is understood as being someone in the Persian Empire, right? If, if he is talking about Darius the Mede receiving the kingdom after the death of Belshazzar, and so long as Darius the Mede is somebody associated with the Persian Empire, then that means that Daniel uh, is right, that he has not committed a historical mistake here. So what we need to do is consider our two options for who Darius the Mede might be in the Persian Empire. The picture you're looking at here is of a Persian palace, which I thought was a fitting background for this. Okay, so who would Darius the Mede be if this is a person of importance within the Persian Empire, as I've suggested? Well, there are only two options. One is that it's uh, Gobirus, who was the general who took over Babylon. You see, uh, Cyrus was the king of Persia, but when his forces captured Babylon, he wasn't there yet, right? His general had to go into Babylon and had to administer over the city uh, until Cyrus could arrive. So maybe the general is the figure called Darius the Mede. Now, one piece of evidence that this idea has in its favor is that this general was the governor of a part of Media uh, prior uh, to coming and taking the city of Babylon. So that could make sense. However, there's no evidence that he was ever called Darius, uh, that he was a Mede, or that his father's name was Ahasuerus, because in Daniel chapter 9, this figure Darius the Mede um, is the son of someone named Ahasuerus, or that he bore the title of a king. He was a general. So, uh, Again, this is several lines of evidence against the general being the figure Darius the Mede. Most likely he died weeks after taking Babylon, so he couldn't be the well-established Darius of Daniel chapter 6. And so there, there are some scholars who go for this, who think of this as a resolution, uh, but I think that the preponderance of evidence is stacked against it and that this is not a very good option. Now, the only other real option is that Cyrus the Great, uh, the Persian king who takes over the Babylonian Empire, he is here being referred to as Darius the Mede. Uh, I think this is the better option, uh, but what is the evidence for this? Well, first of all, in the next chapter, there's going to be a place that says Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, there are two ways you can read this, that he prospered in in two reigns of two different figures here. First, he prospered in the reign of Darius, and then after that, he prospered in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Or you could read this in parallel, that Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, which also was the reign of Cyrus the Persian, because Darius and Cyrus are two different names referring to the same figure. Now, this is uh, a possible way of reading this, uh, the Bible, the Old Testament especially, writes things in parallelism like this all the time. Cyrus took over the Median Empire and had a Median mother. All right, so Cyrus is uh, in Persia. He lives under his Median overlords. 
Well, he rebels against them and he takes over media before he goes to conquer anything else. So he comes from media and he's half Median himself. He has Median blood. So that he could be referred to as a Mede here in this chapter shouldn't be a shock to anybody. He would have also been about 62 when he conquered Babylon. Now this is interesting because uh, our last section of text here specifically says that the, that the Darius the Mede uh, who takes over Babylon is about 62. Well, Cyrus fits the bill. A few months after the capture of Babylon, the king of Media gave Cyrus his daughter in marriage and the crown of Media. He bore the title King of the Medes, right? So he not only has a Median mother, he has a Median princess as a wife. He comes from Median territory. Uh, uh, again, so these are a lot of reasons to think that he could be referred to as a Mede in this passage. Also, his summer palace was in Media, uh, and it was an important administrative center for him. In fact, after he took over the Median uh, territory, a lot of those who had been subjects, they had been vassals of the Median state, the only reason that they submitted to Cyrus uh, is because his marriage to the Median princess, they, they said, okay, he is a legitimate continuation of the Median line, of the Median throne. So if if the vassals of Media thought of him as being a proper Mede, well then why can't Daniel refer to him as being uh, a Median? Cyrus may have taken on Darius as his Median throne name. So he, he has his, his throne name uh, of Persia, where, where he just goes by Cyrus the Great, but it could be the case that Darius was specifically his Median throne name. However, uh, I have not seen any specific evidence for that, uh, though it's discussed sometime in the literature. The biblical writer might just be comfortable calling him Darius the Mede to emphasize that he fulfilled Jeremiah 51, the prophecy that the Medians would take part in the fall of Babylon. So it's not the case that Isaiah and Jeremiah got it wrong when they said that the Medes would tear down Babylon. Now, was it actually the Median kingdom that came and did it? No. However, uh, it was a king of Persia who had Median blood, had the Median throne, uh, Median wife, etc., and so even though the Medes themselves did not come and tear it down, the Medes were reincorporated into the Persian Empire. And then the Persians came and took Babylon. And so Isaiah and Jeremiah still end up being right. It still ends up being a Median king who comes and uh, takes the city. And so Isaiah and Jeremiah are not wrong as many have concluded. Uh, they are right. Uh, they just ended up being right in a way that people did not expect. His being called the son of Ahasuerus in Daniel 9 remains problematic since his father was Cambyses. Persian kings often had more than one throne name. So that, that could be the case, right? It could be the case that Cambyses uh, had more than one name. And so when the Bible says that uh, the father was Ahasuerus, uh, this could just be one of the alternative names for Cambyses. We don't know. We don't have any specific evidence for that. There are, of course, huge gaps in our, in our knowledge. Or it could be that the, a royal title could be applied to any Persian king, just like Pharaoh uh, was applied to any Egyptian king. It could be the case, we don't know this, uh, that Ahasuerus was applied to any Persian king, and we just haven't discovered specific evidence for that. Remember, there was a time when uh, scholarship said that the King Belshazzar, who's been discussed here in Daniel chapter 5, that he didn't even exist, and so the Bible was wrong. Well, then more discoveries were made that the Bible was right. We just had to let our knowledge catch up with the Bible. And so this could be the case here, right? Uh, it could be the case that Cyrus was also called Darius the Mede, that that was his Median throne name, and that his father Cambyses had this alternative name of Ahasuerus. Uh, so that's conjecture. Uh, we don't know that. However, uh, that Darius the Mede received the kingdom and that this in fact was Cyrus the Great, there's a lot of evidence for that just because of all of Cyrus's uh, Median connections. And so this could potentially be 
uh, the answer here. The Bible didn't get it wrong. Darius the Mede is likely a reference to Cyrus. Now this brings us back to the writing on the wall. Uh, mina, a shekel, and paradzine. And paradzine uh, could potentially mean two halves, or it could mean one half. We'll consider both options. Uh, however, these are all forms of currency. Right? A mina is a big amount of money, shekel is a smaller amount of money, and then obviously halves would be smaller than the shekel. Now, the interesting thing here is a mina is 600 grams, which equals 60 shekels. The shekel referred to is, of course, one shekel. And then if there are two half shekels being referred to here with paratine, then that is also one shekel, which gives us a total of 62 shekels, which is interesting because that is the age of Cyrus at the time of Babylon's conquest. We were just told here that Darius the Mede was 62 years old when he took the kingdom. Cyrus was the same age, and the writing on the wall, one of its levels of meaning may point to this. You take the mina, you take the shekel, and you take paratine, if you understand that as being two half shekels, and you get 62 shekels, which points to Cyrus as being Darius the Mede. Now, you will remember from the last video that there are other ways to render the writing on the wall. It could be that there's not one mina, but that there are two, right? And it could be that paratine is not just uh, two half shekels, but rather it is just one half shekel. So you end up with mina, mina, shekel, half shekel. Well, if this is the correct rendering, what could be the significance? It could be that there are three and a half units. A mina is a unit, another mina is a unit, a shekel is a unit, and a half shekel is a half unit. Now that is significant because several times throughout Daniel, three and one half uh, is the number that is used to refer to a great period of tribulation uh, before God vindicates his people. You find this in chapter 7, 8, 9, 12, all those uh, abomination of desolation passages coming up that we're going to talk about in the second half of the book. Uh, there could be some connection here. Three and a half units of money is meant to tie in with these three and a half years or these three and a half times, uh, which represent the tribulation and suffering of God's people uh, before God intervenes and brings the kingdom of God. Also, remember that Daniel chapter two had three and a half kingdoms of metal, right? Gold was the first, silver was the second, bronze was the third, and the fourth was a mixture of iron and clay. It wasn't just iron. And so three and one half times again, uh, before the rock comes and destroys this, uh, this, this statue in Daniel chapter two, which was uh, three and a half kingdoms of metal. So what's the point here? Well, Pace says these examples of three and a fraction highlight the inexorable development of God's plan definitively and suddenly to crush tyrants who oppose his will. That's what all these numbers have in common. Uh, these, these numbers point to uh, a political periods where political tyrants who are against the things of God, will they finally get their just deserts uh, when, when, when God brings justice. And so if we do have mina, mina, shekel, and half shekel here in this passage, it could be to indicate that the reason Belshazzar dies and the kingdom goes to Darius the Mede is because the death of Belshazzar is a foreshadowing and a signpost pointing to the greater resolution uh, of the political problem, the greater resolution of a history full of tyrants who were against God's people and who were against God, who will inevitably come to their destruction when the kingdom of God is fully inaugurated as it is in all these other passages, which are characterized by three and a half units. Three and one half is the most important number in the book of Daniel, easily. This is the number that is invoked when political tyrants get out of line and God has justice in the workings 